Tonight, NASA will launch its first mission to the moon since the Apollo missions almost 50 years ago. The unmanned Artemis I rocket begins a new era of moon exploration as NASA looks to return humans to the lunar surface by 2025. It stands taller than the Statue of Liberty, signalling the dawn of a new era in space exploration, the aim of NASA's Artemis program to return humans to the moon. With the Orion Command capsule at the centre, this is the most powerful rocket ever built. And lift off. It's maiden voyage and unmanned test mission, overseen by a new generation of engineers. They're very wide-eyed and, and doing, a, a, again, a fantastic job. We have some extremely smart people that have come up very quickly through the, the ranks to, to get the positions that they now hold in the firing room. And we have trained and trained to get them to the level at, so that they would be ready to support this launch countdown. And everybody has to have a first one, right? And this is gonna be the first for, for a, a great number of people in that room. We're going to the moon. If all goes to plan, they hope to land the first woman and first person of color on the moon by 2025 keeping America ahead of China. Uh, we're in a space race, and we want to get to the South Pole of the Moon where the resources are, where we think water is. If there's water, there's rocket fuel, mm -hmm. and uh, we don't want China suddenly getting there and saying, ah, this is our exclusive territory. It's half a million miles to the moon and back, but Artemis I is only the start of an ambitious journey. NASA plans to establish a permanent base on the lunar surface, the first step to putting humans on Mars. NASA has registered thousands of watch parties here in America and around the world. It'll be the most consequential liftoff in a generation, and Artemis I is go for launch. David Blevins, Sky News. These are live pictures coming into the newsroom from NASA's Kennedy Space Centre in Florida, where it's just after midnight local time. We're eight hours away from its scheduled launch from the exact same pad used by the last Apollo mission 50 years ago. The rocket is NASA's most powerful yet. It will orbit the moon, staying in space for 42 days before returning to Earth. For more on this, let's bring in James Brown. He's chief executive of the Space Industry Association, of Australia. James, why so long between drinks for NASA? Kieran, it's a good question. I mean, it's been half a century and there was a lot of delay in going back to space after the space shuttle program ended uh, and after NASA decided to deprioritise crewed missions to the moon. But it's exciting to see it back again. That is an enormous rocket. It's a very complex project involving um, parts from Japan and Europe and, and a whole range of international um, partners. And it's very exciting to know that in potentially just under 10 hours, we'll be seeing the first of these missions. And James, this is the precursor, isn't it, to, as, as we heard in that report, to getting humans back onto the lunar surface. Why is this seen, again, as an important step in terms of space exploration? Look, it's about being able to utilise the resources that are on the moon. So there's a process called ISRU, in situ resource utilisation. Our own CSIRO is doing a lot of work on this that's contributing to the uh, to the Artemis mission. But it's about using uh, regolith, moon dust, to create oxygen, to create water, to create rocket fuel. The thinking being that if we can use those resources on the moon, because gravity is lower on the moon than it is on Earth, it'll be much easier to get further out into the universe, particularly to Mars. So this set of missions is all about re-establishing a human presence on the moon so that we can get to Mars. And it'll be unfolding over the next four to five years. By that time, we'll have another human landing on the moon and we'll have uh, a gateway space station in orbit around the moon that is able to do scientific experiments, but also to support activities on the lunar surface. And it comes at a time when we're seeing such incredible breakthroughs on on mapping the the universe, and it, it's just been extraordinary seeing the quality of the images coming back to NASA and others in recent times. I was at a Defence Space Command and DSTO event in Canberra last week looking at some of the 
imagery that the James Webb telescope is sending back compared to what Hubble had viewed before. And it's just uh, an extraordinary advance. I mean, we are literally showing the basic building blocks of time and space. We're showing the very earliest parts of history. That's exciting just from a perspective of, of human discovery. But of course, the technology behind this mission that's being developed to support Artemis is going to have all sorts of practical implications for life on Earth in our everyday economic activities. I mean, we already draw so much from that initial series of Apollo landings, water filtration, wearable devices, mobile phone technology, microwaves, all came out of that technology uh, developed in the 1970s and 1960s. So we will be seeing technology that comes out of these missions that will have profound impacts for our everyday life in the next five to 10 years. And it's really exciting to think through where that might be. It is exciting, and, and certainly I was talking to some of my colleagues earlier about the, the quality of the images we can expect from the moon. If we could see those television images back uh, 50 years ago or more than 50 years ago when uh, there was that, those, those first expeditions... Imagine the quality and the communication in 2025 when humans return there. Yeah, and that's, you know, I mean, there's a big effort underway at the moment to set up uh, lunar communications relays, and that's effectively uh, a flying internet, satellite internet constellation around the moon to get these signals back to communicate with people when they're operating in, in difficult locations on the lunar surface that are out of sight from, from Earth. And, of course... All of those signals will be coming back to NASA in part through the deep space tracking station just south of Canberra. I mean, when we went to the moon uh, more than you know more than 50 years ago now, I had that first landing. The first video images came back through Australia. They came through um, our dishes. They went out along the cable um, off Sydney's coast. There were teams of NASA engineers here to make sure that happened. And 50 years later, the same thing will be true. We'll be getting those signals back to Australia to assist with this mission. So it's really exciting. Um, the, the leap forward in technology is amazing. I mean, the spacesuits that uh, the crash test dummies inside the rocket are wearing for this launch tonight are just generational leaps ahead of the spacesuits that, um, that Neil Armstrong and his colleagues wore back in the 1960s. Uh, and the propulsion technology is so much more powerful than those original Apollo rockets. Um, and, of course, we've seen just massive changes in, in what we can do to get people up to space with the work that SpaceX is doing. So Australia will be watching this. Of course, we've got our own uh, rover that will be part of this mission set that's due to go to the moon in 2026 as well, and teams are assembling at the moment to start building that. So, as we know, the, the generations past, it was part of the space race, that effort to get to the moon. What are uh, some of the other big nations spending on this sort of technology now? US, obviously, is dominating our focus with NASA and this moon expedition. But what is happening, happening with comparable efforts internationally? Look, China is catching up fast. It's spending a lot on its space development and its space technology. We saw... Just last week, one of our members, Leo Labs, tracked uh, China launching a space plane that is now flying around the Earth's surface. Uh, sorry, now flying around the Earth, doing all sorts of experiments. We know there's a lot of military activity in space. China, over the last couple of years, has very quickly built its own um, space station in orbit, and it's continuing to build that. It's also doing things like looking at uh, whether solar power can be generated in space and sent back to the Earth. And, of course, Russia remains a significant uh, space power with a lot of satellites in orbit. Um, but really, at the moment, the, the activity is between the US and China. Uh, they have the most launch activity. They have the most uh, military and intelligence activity in space. And, of course, they've got the most sophisticated programs able to do missions like this to put humans into orbit and beyond. James Brown, the Chief Executive of the Space Industry Association of Australia, thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon. And don't miss our complete coverage of the NASA Artemis One rocket launch. It's live on Sky News, 10.30, just after 10.30pm tonight. Make sure you tune in.